Uh, next up is uh, Rachel. Rachel Wilson is a professor of neurobiology at HMS, and she uses a combination of genetic, psychological, and behavioral approaches to explore how sensory stimuli are, pro are processed by neural circuits. She'll describe uh, why she believes there's value in the scientific research that's driven by cure, uh, pure curiosity uh, rather than any specific scientific focus on a particular disease, so-called discovery science. It's important because the need for knowledge is unpredictable and its application is also often unpredictable. And she'll describe how the support of discovery science as a pure science creates reservoirs of knowledge that allow us to overcome unexpected challenges. Rachel? Thanks very much. My mission tonight is to try to convince you that <coughs> curiosity can cure disease. And in fact, curiosity is essential to curing disease in the long term. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is a little bit different from previous talks. I'm not going to focus mainly on my own research or a specific wedge of biomedical science. Uh, I'm going to talk to you um, sort of personally about my values. And in particular, uh, you, this could be titled, Seven Things That I've Learned as a Scientist. In particular, I'm a scientist who works in a particular area of uh, biomedical research, and that is basic science or pure discovery research. The work in my laboratory and the work in the laboratories next to mine is motivated first and foremost by our own curiosity. So how does that work? Why do I do it? And what is our rationale? I think the number one lesson I've learned as a scientist, and I think this is something that applies to us as a society, is that we should expect the unexpected. It's really the unexpected crises that, by definition, we are least able to cope with. The classic example of this from uh, modern medicine, I would say, is perhaps the AIDS epidemic. I'm showing you on the right hand of the screen here um, a page from the Centers for Disease Control report uh, from the early 80s that describes some of the first AIDS patients. When they walked into those clinics, the symptoms they had were bewildering. But quite rapidly, medical science, and I'm proud about this, Medical science was able to find um, drugs that could improve and extend the lives of these patients. Why is that? Well, we quickly realized that these patients suffered from a viral infection, and the culprit was a retrovirus. That's a particular type of virus. Luckily, we were sitting on a reservoir of knowledge about retroviruses because, first and foremost, scientists had been curious about these <coughs> peculiar viruses. Beyond that, there was a hypothesis kicking around at the time that many cancers might be caused by retroviruses. We now know that's wrong. Most cancers are not caused by viruses. This was a dead end for cancer research, but it turned out to be um, a lifesaver for AIDS research and AIDS patients. And I think that makes the point very concretely that as a scientific community and as a society, we need to put knowledge in the bank. What I'm showing you here looks a bit like a bank. It's actually the library of Harvard Medical School. And I've spent hours in this library looking at uh, books and journal articles. And I'll tell you, this building is filled with facts. Many of them seem random and obscure. And we just don't know which of those facts will, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, turn out to be essential to facing the next crisis, like the AIDS crisis. Lesson number three. We have to focus on what we do not understand. This sounds a bit obvious as scientists, but I'll tell you it's much harder to do in practice than it sounds in theory. Um, the reason is it, is it actually fights against some of our human instincts. Some of you have heard the old joke about um, the drunk man and the policeman. So the policeman goes up to this man who's standing under a street light on a dark night and says, what are you doing here? And the drunk man says, I'm looking for my house keys. And the policeman says, um, I don't see any keys here under the street light. And the drunk man says, I'm sad to tell you I also don't see any keys, but it's really the only place I can look. And I think as scientists, we kind of cringe when we hear this because um, we know that some of us engage in a little bit of street light looking. We tend to look where things are most convenient and easy 
And the hard thing is to push ourselves to look outside of the boundaries of the street lights light, um, because that's where research is really risky, um, and that's where research most needs to be supported. Lesson four, I think that nature is really the best laboratory, and any research scientist will tell you that. I'm gonna tell you a little story about this molecule. It's called Taxol, and um, it's a powerful chemotherapy agent. It's improved and extended the lives of uh, many cancer patients. In the 1960s, um, botanists working for the USDA had collected thousands of samples of plants, and the NIH got a hold of those samples and started screening them for anti-cancer activity. And the bark of the Pacific yew, which is illustrated on the left here, um, turned out to contain this agent Taxol that inhibited the growth of tumors. Unfortunately, it took uh, 1,000 kilograms of bark to produce 10 grams of Taxol, and this pretty rapidly uh, drove the Pacific yew into an endangered state. So a new source was needed. Back to the botanists. They, of course, had spent decades studying the interrelationships between the Pacific yew and other related plants, and they knew what the most closely related species were. Turns out that several of those species, some of them from Europe, also contain Taxol, and as a result, now uh, we have plenty of Taxol to treat cancer with, and the Pacific U is no longer in danger. I like this story for two reasons. First of all, it illustrates that branches of science, branches of biology that have um, seemingly nothing to do with medicine can be critical to coping with medical crises. And second of all, it illustrates the importance of understanding the interrelationships between species here on Earth. Um, and that, I think, is essential in our work as biologists, particularly biologists who work in basic science research. We need to look for connections. Here's another little story. If you catch a fruit fly in your kitchen and you look at it under the microscope, you'll notice that it's covered with small hairs. All the hairs lie in the same direction. They lie parallel to each other, like the fly has been combed with a comb. So some decades ago, scientists screened for mutants um, where the hairs were disordered. Uh, and they found one such mutant. Those of you at the back might not be able to see this, but the image on the far right shows hairs that are all disordered. They're not pointing in the same direction anymore. Um, well, it turns out that the gene that was mutated here is a gene that you and I have in our own bodies, and it's in um, all mammals. In fact, it's in a wide variety of organisms. If you look at mutants of the same gene uh, in mice, they have the exact same characteristic. The fur on the mouse's back is now no longer smooth. All the hairs are pointed in different directions. And to me, that's kind of a striking example of the fact that not only do um, many organisms on Earth share the same genes, the same genetic inheritance, but those genes often serve similar functions. The punchline here is that this also taught us about cancer. It turns out that the genes in this genetic pathway, many of them are, turn out to be implicated as oncogenes, genes that when they're mutated um, or dysregulated give rise to cancers. And in fact, um, a large fraction of colorectal cancers turn out to involve mutations in this genetic pathway. And believe it or not, studies of the development of hairs in the fruit fly have given rise to a lot of really um, deep understanding of the biology of tumors in human beings. Number six. We just have to follow curiosity. At the end of the day, we ought to work on things that get us passionate. I'm showing you here a picture of algae. And this, I'm about to tell you one of the most, I think, exciting stories for a brain scientist to arise in recent years. These algae are single-celled organisms, but even though they only have a single cell, they can sense light, lacking an eye, and they can swim toward light. They can beat their flagella to move toward light. They engage in photosynthesis. So, how does an algae see when it's only one cell? It turns out, and scientists have found that algae can, these algae contain pores, the small um, proteins, that in the presence of light open. And when they open, current rushes into the cell. That changes the electrical potential of the cell, it changes how the flagelli beat, and it causes the algae to move toward light. That sounds like a miraculous story, but it has nothing to do with medicine. And that's where we're wrong. So brain scientists, meanwhile, were watching this story unfold, and several, several kind of um, clever neuroscientists got the idea of 
taking these pores from algae and placing them in individual brain cells. And by placing them in specific brain cells that control specific cognitive or behavioral or perceptual functions, it turns out that we can manipulate the electrical activity of those cells and manipulate um, the organism's perception and behavior. And the idea is that you shine light on brain cells that contain this pore, the pore opens, it changes the electrical activity of those cells, and you know that this is how brain cells communicate with each other using electrical signals. Now in laboratories all around the world, including my laboratory, we're in the business of placing these pores from algae into individual different brain cells of different types and studying how that changes the animal's thought processes and behavior. And in doing this, we're learning an enormous amount. And of course, it has therapeutic potential as well. Already, scientists are exploring how this can be used to restore vision to blind patients, for example. And it's widely acknowledged that it has applications for neuropsychiatric disease. Finally, I think we need to foster curiosity in others. And I speak here um, as a parent of a small child who's obviously an incredibly curious character um, to me, and that's a delight to my heart. But I also speak as a scientist who trains other scientists. I train graduate students in my laboratory and in my graduate program. We're all born curious. Um, any parent knows that. But curiosity can be extinguished. And I think it's often extinguished by stress. Um, in a stressful situation, we stop listening to those questions inside our head. And instead, we just focus on what seems most urgent at the moment. And right now, funding for science in the United States is under stress. And this is putting a lot of pressure on scientists like me to focus on specific diseases. Of course, disease-driven research is incredibly important. But I think if we stop doing curiosity-driven research, eventually our reservoirs of knowledge will dwindle. And I think that's a danger. So these, I think, are some of the values that motivate me in my work as a research scientist. And I wanted to share them with you today to let you know why I'm passionate about my work. And I just want to close by letting you know what I, I hope I have accomplished here. I hope that when you pick up the newspaper tomorrow when you read about some discovery some scientist has made about algae or plants um, or something like that, the DNA of bears, you'll realize that um, perhaps this is not so crazy. It may be that this is a scientist who's got the vision and the guts to look outside of the penumbra of the streetlight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that stimulating. So we'll have to stop saying curiosity killed the cat and start saying curiosity will cure the cat. Um, you mentioned funding, though, which I think is a really interesting and practical question. And with all of the pressure on time and on resource, money and other, how do we decide um, where in the dark we um, kind of ex extend our curiosity? I think that's an important question. And I mean, I've been speaking sort of from the heart. I've been emphasizing that you have to be personally passionate about what you're stu studying if you're going to do this kind of research. But personal passion is not enough, and we do have to make hard choices about what to fund, even within curiosity driven research. I think that kind of there are two metrics that are um, important. One is, um, is, is this research focusing on something that we don't actually understand? So is this research going outside of the shadow of the streetlight? On the other hand, is this research likely to produce an answer to a question? In other words, are you likely to find a pair of keys? <laughs> outside of the streetlight in the course of this research. And those two things are sort of in tension with each other. And that's part of the art of being a curiosity-driven researcher and also in training students in this area. How do you pick a research topic that extends into the unknown but is also very likely uh, to provide something interesting? I think you also asked or posed a um, stimulating uh, question, which is how do, we, how do we stimulate curiosity in our children and, and in our grown people uh, that, are that are working with us in the area of research? I think part of um, what we do is um, uh, to give people the freedom to follow their passion as long as it seems that there's some feasible answer to the question in sight. And, and again, not to put people into too much stress. 
I've seen that when graduate students are put on a lot of pressure and told you need to get results right away, they stop being curious and they just kind of buckle down and look under the street light. But the same thing is happening on a broader level with funding. So with NIH funding being more and more fragile, I think more and more um, scientists are uh, a little bit worried about building a laboratory that follows curiosity, and I think that's a danger. And last but not least, how do we take that wealth, that bank of knowledge that you're suggesting we build and match it to the problems of the day? I mean, how do we get uh, beyond a fact uh, serendipitously matched to a need to something more purposeful in using this curiosity-driven research? Yeah, I mean, the last speaker spoke to that. I think a lot of this has to do with just intelligent mining of data. But I'm actually, to be honest, less worried about that part. And I think that part of that comes from my experience as a brain scientist. I've seen this discovery of um, uh, essentially um, the ability of algae to see light translate incredibly rapidly into a tool that brain scientists can use to study the activity of brain function. So brain scientists didn't have to be incentivized to jump on that um, bandwagon once that tool became available. I think, however, that the people studying algae needed to be given some funding in order to do that research, and that's, I think, the fragile part. Great. Well, we have a lot in front of us with this, and our curiosity is now up for the evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>